Hi everyone, welcome back to Project Infinity. Most Farnsworth fusers employ a spherically shaped inner grid, but today I'm actually more interested in seeing how the plasma interacts with a variety of uniquely shaped inner grids. Let's go ahead and have a look. So while I'm certainly not the first to try different shapes for a fuser's inner grid, I mostly wanted to have fun, explore concepts, and see if the plasma behaves in any interesting ways. Here are all the grid geometries I'd like to try. I wanted to start really simple, so I just made a single ring design to see how much an effect this would have on the plasma. Next, I wound the wire in the shape of a helix. Then I made a helical cross shape. Getting a little more unique, I created an hourglass and a cone shape grid. I attempted my best cube shape. And lastly, for the tokamak lovers out there, I made a tungsten helix wound to form a toroid. This design was inspired from the folks at fuser.net and I'm quite excited to see how it works. Notice I didn't include the standard spherical grid as I've already demonstrated that along with some basic fusion theory in a separate video. If you're interested in watching that video, you can find a link to it in the description below. To begin, I figured I'd show how the plasma behaves within the chamber without using any grid at all. So I replaced the grid holder feed through with a modified spark plug to work as our cathode. This way, this first demonstration acts as our control to compare against the different ways the plasma will react to the various grid shapes we'll use later. I'll start each demo at a slight vacuum and we can watch what happens as the chamber is pumped down to lower and lower pressures. Notice the plasma starts by growing outward with respect to the cathode and uniformly fills the entire chamber. Once the pressure drops more though, the voltage increases and we can see quite a bit of instability. The plasma is not very well controlled and will get no confinement or controlled recirculation of ions. Let's move on to the first grid. Replacing the spark plug with the ring shaped grid now functioning as our cathode, we'll immediately see a difference in how the plasma behaves. Electrons emitted from the negatively charged grid ionize nearby air molecules. These newly formed positively charged ions concentrate around the grid due to their electrostatic attraction. As the pressure drops, the mean free path is lengthened so neutral air molecules are ionized further away from the cathode, and they travel further before cooling down and recombining to become neutral air molecules again. Eventually though, the ions have enough kinetic energy to be influenced by the grid a little differently. They accelerate toward the grid's negative electrostatic charge, but because they still have so much energy, they stay charged long enough to shoot past the grid, get repelled by the chamber's positively charged outer walls, and then accelerate back again toward the grid. Because the grid was formed into a ring shape, it functions as an electrostatic lens and focuses the ions along the horizontal axis of the fusion chamber. Pretty cool. Here's a look at what happens at even lower pressures. We see a much higher voltage, meaning the ions have much more kinetic energy. And with all these ions being accelerated toward the grid, many of them end up actually striking it and therefore transferring their energy. The energy can accumulate quite spectacularly. The stainless steel grid was glowing white hot, so this tells me it's getting pretty close to its melting point. Moving on to the helical grid, it starts as a glow discharge similar to that of the ring shaped grid. A helix is essentially the same concept as a ring, only consisting of many rings all aligned on the horizontal axis of the vacuum chamber. The additional rings dramatically improve the grid's ability to focus the plasma, as we can see it's noticeably more concentrated within the center of the helix. The blue beam that just formed is caused by the electrons produced on the inner surface of the helix. They're repelled by the negative charge, so they concentrate on the center of the helix and then emanate from the largest aperture they can find, which in this case is on either side of the grid. Once this electron jet starts to disappear, what remains is this soft channel of plasma. Usually with a standard spherical grid setup, the loss of this electron jet signals the end of jet mode and the beginning of star mode. So I think this is the helical grid's expression of star mode. Star mode indicates the mean free path has exceeded the length of the vacuum chamber, which allows for ion recirculation. Recirculation is when the ions oscillate back and forth through the grid, being repelled by the walls and then attracted to the grid over and over again before they interact with any other particle. Unfortunately, without a turbo molecular or diffusion pump, it's difficult to get the pressure down much lower to investigate if we'd achieve a tighter beam, which is more characteristic of classic star mode. Next up is the cross shape. 
I was going for a similar approach to the helix, however these helices, when formed into a cross, mimic the shape of the vacuum chamber. My vacuum chamber is made from an NW63 size cross and is what's functioning as our anode. This shape should allow for more symmetry, so it'll be interesting to note any differences from using the helix alone. This looks pretty similar to the helix at first, but I do notice more of a symmetric poiser formed within the center of the grid. The helix formed more of an ovoid shaped poiser that wasn't very well defined. This one looks more spherical, smaller, and has very well defined edges. This must have to do with the improved symmetry. Fast forwarding to lower pressures, I noticed some serious oscillations. My best guess is the wire stem holding the grid in place is acting like a spring and there's some sort of electromechanical resonance going on. It's interesting that this was the only grid I noticed these vibrations. Either way, it resolved itself and I let the chamber evacuate more to attempt higher voltages. At 19.3 millitor, I managed to get the voltage to peak at a moderate 9.5 kilovolts. We'll see if we can improve on that. Here's the beginning of the hourglass shape grid. The sparks you'll see on the wires is caused by a process called sputter cleaning. As the ions increase their kinetic energy, they hit contaminants and eject them from the surface of the material, and they subsequently burn up. The hourglass grid looks like it's performing similarly to the helix, only it has predictably wider bugle jets protruding from each end. Here you can see it almost wants to form two poisers on either side of the constricted center, and reaching a lower pressure of 18.9 millitor, I found a peak voltage of about 11.75 kilovolts. I thought it would be interesting to introduce some asymmetry to the plasma with the cone-shaped grid. Admittedly, I thought I might see the plasma act more like a nozzle, concentrating and accelerating the particles to the right of the grid through the narrow aperture, but that didn't seem to be the case. If anything, we found the exact opposite effect. The electron jet only protrudes from the left side of the grid, suggesting the grid acts more like a hollow cathode. This is the concept I introduced earlier. In a hollow cathode, electrons emitted from the inner surface of the electrode are ejected from the largest aperture. On the way though, they can bounce back and forth within the cathode, amplifying ionization as they go. This effect drives ionization within the standard spherical grid, and it stands to reason that it's also present to some extent in all the grids I'm testing today. So while this isn't the most efficient grid, I really enjoyed seeing how differently they can all function. At lower pressures, the beam actually does start to extend through the right side of the grid, and we also notice formation of a poiser asymmetrically located slightly to the left of the chamber's center. Next up is the cubically shaped grid. Although this grid design is relatively straightforward, manufacturing this thing was actually quite a bit of a challenge. I could bend two wire squares individually, but brazing four wires to connect the two squares while preserving the cube-like appearance became somewhat complex. I'm glad I made it though because functionally this grid performs really well. We're seeing a tight poiser formed in the middle of the grid, so its symmetry is providing a nicely focused plasma. This should come as no surprise though because the symmetry is likely attributed again to this being a cross-shaped chamber, so this is acting similarly to the helical cross we tested earlier. I think the cube is performing better though because its large openings allow decently high transparency to the hot plasma. Even at a comparatively higher pressure of 23.7 millitor, our voltage peaked at about 12.25 kilovolts. This is also the best star mode I've ever been able to achieve in my fuser, so I'm really excited with how this is working. I'll definitely have to explore this concept more in future experiments. And lastly, we have the toroid grid, or as Mark Riley from Fuser.net aptly dubbed it, the Toka grid. I honestly didn't know what to expect from this grid, but it certainly didn't disappoint. You can see that at these high pressures, it truly looks like the plasma is confined within the ring. You'll notice I added a wire that passes through the center of the toroid that makes contact with the top and bottom of the vacuum chamber. Since the chamber is positively biased, the inner wire functions to repel the ions from what's effectively the donut hole and helps them stay concentrated within the toroid ring. Along with some sputter cleaning, we see a bugle jet protruding from the left side of the grid. And fair warning, there's going to be some strobing here in a second, so skip ahead to the next chapter if you're sensitive to that. As pressures drop below 60 millitor, the plasma became quite unstable. It looks like it oscillates between bugle jets on the left and right sides of the grid, so I'd imagine the instability has something to do with the grid symmetry. Regardless, I was able to stop the flickering by decreasing the current a little bit, And 
As the pressure continued to drop, the ring of plasma seemed to flatten out in the back of the grid and formed a poiser in the front. The formation of a poiser leads me to believe that the ions are not confined within the toroid, but are recirculating in and out of the grid, and the poiser is just where they're most highly concentrated. Here's where I was really surprised though. The voltage was climbing quite high considering the current pressure, and I eventually reached full-on plasma extinction. The voltage required to ignite the plasma exceeded that which my power supply can provide. I had to inject a slow flow of air into the vacuum chamber just to reignite the plasma. The results of this test make me really excited to try this grid in a deuterium environment sometime in the future. Well, that's all I've got for this video. Please consider subscribing and pressing the like button to support my channel and help my videos get a little more exposure. And if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments section. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.